Welcome to the Kerry Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. My name is Kerry Newhoff, and my goal is to help you lead like never before. So what I do every week is I sit down with world-class leaders and church leaders, business leaders, and I talk to them about what made them who they are and try to have the conversation with them that you would have if you got to sit down for lunch with them or have dinner with them or really got to spend some time with them. So we go into the backstory and we explore what made them who they are and some of the principles they've learned along the way. So if you enjoy this episode, I would love for you to like it, to subscribe, and also to share it with your friends. And in the meantime, here's today's episode. What would you say the spiritual temperature of New York was when you arrived? Well, it, it was very vital in the boroughs mm. because for about... Um, 30 years were all these new churches getting started in, uh, but from non-Western missionaries. So that, in other words, the people who were starting churches were from Africa, Latin America, Asia. And they were planting hundreds and hundreds of churches. That was from probably around 1970 to about the year 2000 or so. When I got here, just starting the 90s, Manhattan was very, very um, uh, secular, but the rest Ooh. of the city was not. So if you went to a community board meeting <coughs> in uh, the Bronx, for example, it might be open in prayer wow. because most of, the, uh, most of the civic leaders were black and Hispanic Pentecostal ministers. And if you went to Brooklyn, you might, it, might, uh, it would be filled with Orthodox Jews. And if you went out to Queens, the uh, community boards would be filled with uh, Asian Christians. But in, in, a, in Manhattan was secular, and mm. the, the churches were extremely small or dying and so when I got here the the spiritual growth that had been happening in the rest of the city hadn't really reached the center but it changed that since then. I've anymore. heard a stat it may or may not be accurate that something like less than one percent of Manhattan was attending an evangelical yeah, church when yeah, you arrived. Is right that? well we, we define center city as from the top of Man the top of Central Park okay um, south to the to the tip plus a little bit of Brooklyn a little bit of Queens, in other words, the very near environs. That we would call that center city, right. cosmopolitan, very wealthy, professional. There's about a million, one million fifty thousand people that live in that area, and from what we can tell, 1989, there are only nine thousand Manhattan residents going to wow. evangelical churches out of wow. the one million in 1989, and by 2014, there were about fifty-four thousand. So that was a kind of <coughs> growth of about quintupled. Yeah, yeah, in about in about uh, 25 years. Wow. So that's been the biggest change. Let's have a seat. Okay. Yeah. There we are. Um, so let's drill down a little bit further, Tim. Uh, when you look back on the last 10 years when it comes to the church in America, so just think about the last decade, what do you see changing? And let's start with things that, you can celebrate. You're like, this is very encouraging. We went there a little bit with the growth of the church in Manhattan, but just think about the church in America or the church in the West. What have been some bright spots in the last decade? Well, I wouldn't say there's, there's not a lot. <laughs> I mean, I've, oh, let's put it this way. Certainly there are a lot, but I mean, th there's probably more, more cons there's more areas of concern than there are bright spots, sure. honestly. But bright spots, I think, is the growth of new multi-ethnic churches, by mm. and large. There's a lot more of those. Um, I do think that the, um, the future of Western society and Western culture is multi-ethnic. Yeah. Um, uh, there's a lot of reasons why that's true. I'm not, uh, I'm not so much celebrating it or denigrating it at all. I'm just saying that the percentage of white people in the West and in the world will be smaller and smaller. Um, there will be more uh, there will be more multiracial marriages, there will be more multi-ethnic communities and cities. That's still not true for parts of the heartland like, you know, Iowa and New Hampshire are still 90% white and so on. But by and large, that's changing and the church is changing there too. That there really are more efforts to create multiracial churches. There are, uh, especially in cities, there's more of them. And I think that's, to me, maybe the biggest bright spot because that's keeping up with the changes. 
What are some of the challenges you see over the last decade? Well, I just see exactly what Re Leslie Newbigin saw, and that's, so this is nothing but, don't give me any credit for this at all. I'm just channeling him. <clears throat> he would say that for a thousand years, the Western Church assumed a mission model in which most people in the culture would feel some social pressure or at least see some social benefits going to church. Yeah. And um, the culture created people that had, a, had the basic furniture uh, for a Christian worldview. That is, they usually believed in a personal God. They often believed in an afterlife, heaven and hell. Uh, they believed that they should be good and they weren't perfect and that therefore they, they, you know, they did need forgiveness. So uh, you could call those the religious dots Mm -hmm. <clears throat> belief in God, belief in an afterlife, belief in the moral law, belief in sin. And so these are, the church could assume that people would be, would just show up in church if they were invited, or they would show up in church maybe at Easter and Christmas, or maybe for weddings and funerals. And they would, if they came, they would have a general respect for the Bible, and they would have some basic understanding of these things. And evangelism was just waiting for people to show up and then connecting the dots. <laughs> but what do you do if people don't come to church, won't come to church, why should they, and don't have the dots? So you can't evangelize by saying, oh, you want to go to heaven when you die, right? And you know you're not perfect, but Jesus Christ died for your sins so that you can be sure, if you believe in him, that when you die, you'll go to heaven. So that's assuming all the dots. And what if the dots aren't there? Now what do we do? And Newbigin's basically saying that the entire Western church for a thousand years has assumed a Christendom culture. And now that it's gone, it has no way of reaching people, doesn't know how to talk to people, get their attention. It doesn't know how, even if they do show up, it, they don't know how to share the gospel in a way that makes sense to them. So is that a cause for concern? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that's why I say, that to me, that is, that is an overshadowing <clears throat> concern. Yeah. How do you see that show up in the model of church that you see in America today? What do you think? You think a lot of evangelicalism or even mainline evangelicalism is still waiting for people to show up yes. and connect the dots? Yes. And uh, now the Willow Creek uh, seeker model yeah. w did take one step in the direction of saying people aren't going to come to church unless they're great production values. Mm. Uh, so they, they don't feel the same social pressure to go to church. But even that seeker service model kind of assumes that people would see a social benefit. Right. And that they have somewhat, tr a tr a somewhat of a traditional mindset that they would say church is good and it's good to be talking about these moral issues and it's good to be talking about how do you handle anxiety I would still say that they are assuming a kind of a, um, a, still a fairly traditional kind of person that would come in the door. They're not looking at people, I don't think they're reaching people who feel like the church is an agent for injustice. I don't think they know what to do with people who say, you can't make me feel guilty because um, uh, the meaning of life is not to be good, a good person. See, that's what my, my family, my parents' generation, whether they're Christians or not. Yeah. The meaning of life is to be good. Today, the meaning of life is to be true to yourself. Mm. And that's, I, I just don't think that our church today has any way of dealing with that. We, and they, they certainly don't know how to, answer, how to answer somebody who says, I'm just being true to myself. So when you look at your ministry at Redeemer, how did you respond to that? How did you attempt to say, okay, we're going to turn the dial on that a little bit differently? Well, the 30 years ago, it, there wasn't yet that... Inf <clears throat> the emphasis on being true to yourself and, and creating yourself. You might say yeah. that when I came along, my parents' generation, whether they're Christians or not, believed the meaning of life was to be good. Yeah. And the way you preach to them was to deal with their guilt <laughs> and say, you're never going to overcome your guilt with... Uh, moral effort. You're going to have to get forgiveness from Jesus. So it, that sort of thing is what you did. By the time I came along to New York, and New York was a little more, it was further advanced than the rest of the country. Went right. Toward more Instead secular. Of a canary and a coal yeah, mine. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, when I got here, the meaning of life was to be free to discover your true self. Uh, that's very Rousseau. Jean, that, that's very much like what Rousseau would say, which is society kind of screws you up. 
but in your, there's an inner child in there, a kind of perfect inner being, and um, the world makes you feel very guilty about it, and you just need to be free to discover who you really are and, and uh, express that without guilt. That was very Freudian. Hmm. Uh, it was very psychological. When I got here, all the talk was about um, dysfunctional families and enabling behavior and getting free from people making you feel guilty. Right. So it was actually, that's the reason why, if you just preach why, if, if you assume people are guilty and then they know they ought to be guilty and then you give them the relief through Jesus, you try to do that with the people that were in front of me in New York, they would have just walked out the door. They said, that's what I don't need, I don't need that. And so the way the gospel worked with um, my parents' generation was, you know you should be good, but you're not as good as you would like to be. But Jesus Christ can forgive you, and in him you can be accepted by God. With my young people that I came to here in New York, basically I said, you think the meaning of life is to be free, but you're actually not as free as you think you are. You have to live for something. Everybody has to live for something, and whatever that thing is you're living for will enslave you. And you will feel guilty and shameful because you'll never feel like you can live up to it. So let's just say, well, I've left my little Bible-believing church back in Hot Coffee, Mississippi, and I've moved up here to be an actress or to be an actor or to make it on Wall Street. Well, guess what? You've got a new God. Hmm. You've got a new master. And when you say, I'm going to be free to discover that my true self, now you're going to have to live up to that, and you're actually still a slave. You'd be a slave to your work. You'd be a slave to your, you know, your, your figure. You gotta keep your weight down, you'll be a slave. You think you're free, but you're not, because if you're living for anything but God, you're uh, a slave. And Jesus Christ is the only master who, if you get him, will satisfy you, and if you fail him, can forgive you. Your career can't die for your sins. And so that's how I did it with them, and it, it was okay. In other words, I assumed their cultural narrative and showed how only in Christ could their you might say, their, their storyline have a happy ending. Mm -hmm. Just like I did that with my parents' generation. Today, it actually has changed again because there's not that same feeling like I just need to be free to find my inner child of the past, uh, inner child of the past. Now, the emphasis is not psychological, it's sociological. It's all about justice. Mm. It's all about uh, creating your own self. If I say I'm this, that's who I am, I can do right. that. And it's all about uh, including marginalized peoples, uh, marginalized identities. And it actually would, it, this, the change was happening just as I was stepping out. So literally the and last I, six years. Yeah, in the last five or six years. And therefore, if I was starting a church now, I'd have to, I'd have to retool again. Really? Yeah. What do you think, like just off the top of your head? But I haven't done it. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. So you're saying, what would you do? I said, What well, would you do? Um, even a couple of broad strokes? Yeah, yeah, a couple of broad strokes would be to say um, the um, Christianity gives you the only identity that is, uh, because it's all about identity now. Yeah. You know? okay. Christianity is the only identity that is received, not achieved. Uh, if you say, I can create myself, that's a lot of pressure. Um, if, uh, and you can see it online. You can see people, they come up with an identity and then they just scream at each other if you don't uh, support my identity um, or then you get, be, you get screamed at if you're not true to your identity. You know, say, you say you're this, but you know, you're hurting the rest of us who are like this. And it's, I said, it's, uh, uh, I said, Christianity is the one identity that's received. In other words, the fact is that because of what Jesus Christ did, Jesus Christ is actually a person who um, lost his glory and his power and his privilege and came and died on the cross for us, paid the penalty for our inhumanity to God and to each other. In other words, he took the penalty. And because of that, when I believe in him, I can actually know that God loves me unconditionally forever. You know, I'm righteous in Christ. And what that means is the minute I become a Christian, the minute I believe in God, um, God loves me as perfectly as he will love me five billion years from now when I'm perfect. And he loves me that well right now. Now what that means is it's the ups and downs of my performance. And see, all postmodern people say that identity is performative. Mm. They say power is performative. They say 
they say identity is, is, is a, it's a role that you play. That's horrible <laughs> pressure. I said, we've got an identity that's received, not achieved. That it's not up and down depending on how well I perform. And, and also, this is an identity that doesn't exclude. Because if you have an identity that's based on being an open-minded, justice-oriented person, then you're going to despise the bigots. And one of the reasons you despise the bigots is a way of you bolstering your kind of flagging sense of self-worth by saying, I'm basically saying, oh Lord, I thank thee I am not as other men, including <laughs> yeah. this tax collector right here. And that's how you bolster a, an insecure identity by excluding other people and looking down at them saying, I must be okay because I'm not like these horrible people over here. With a Christian identity, you don't have to do that. You, you will not do that. In fact, um, in James chapter 1, verse 9 and 10, it's interesting. It says that the rich Christian should think about his low position and the poor Christian should think about his high position. Hmm. Now, what's beautiful about that is the Christian identity says you're a sinner and you would go to hell if it wasn't for Jesus Christ. So it's got the lowest, it, it makes you come all the way down here and say, I can't save myself. So you have a low position, you're a sinner, you deserve nothing but judgment. And yet, in Christ, I am loved more than I dared hope. I'm accepted, uh, Jesus Christ says, the Father loves you even as he loves me. Now what's interesting is if you're a poor person, and look, at, look how brilliant the Christian identity is. If you're a poor person, and um, all of your life you've been told you're nothing, <laughs> and you become a Christian, you should dwell on your high position. Dwell on who you are in Jesus Christ, and that will overcome all of the crap you've gotten for so many years from people. Yeah. But what if you're a rich Christian? What if you're a person that you've gone to the right schools and you've gotten all these, all your life people have been telling you how great you are. Whew, you become a Christian, you need, you need to remember your low position. You need to remember that you are a sinner saved by sheer grace, that you are no better than anybody else. What's brilliant about the, the Christian identity is it doesn't exclude people, and it actually, it, it, it's, a, it's an enormous equalizer, and it takes all the pressure off. Now, that's where I would be going. Hmm. I would be saying, I don't care how you guys are forming your identity. There is no identity like the one that you can find in Jesus Christ. So that's not the same quite as 30 years ago where I said there's no freedom like you get in Jesus. And there's, you know, it's not like what I would have preached down in Hopewell, Virginia, which I did in the 1970s when all the people out there were like my parents. Hmm. So you've got to connect the gospel with, the gospel is that Jesus saves you, you don't. Right. And you have to connect it to the, the cultural narrative. So just exegeting the culture. Yeah, but then you, right, but then you've actually got to find a way to take the plot line of the culture and give it a happy ending in Jesus. So, for example, 1 Corinthians 1, the Greek, it says the Jews want power and the Greeks want wisdom, but the cross is weakness to the Jews and foolishness to the Greeks, but to the Jews and Greeks that are being saved, the true wisdom and true power of God. So what is Paul doing? He says, the cultural narrative of the Jews is, we want, we're pragmatic, we want to know how you get things done. Give me power. The cultural narrative of the Greeks was, they're the artists. They're the, you know, we want contemplation, we want wisdom, we want beauty. And what he's saying is, the gospel confronts the idolatries of both of those cultures differently, but also fulfills them differently. The cross confronts the uh, idolatry of power and of wisdom, but then it says, but the cross is the true wisdom, the true power of God. In the cross, you actually get, O oh, culture, what you want. <laughs> so it's not just cultural exegesis. It's uh, con contradictive fulfillment. It's subverting it and fulfilling it. And that's what you have to do in every culture. That's the, basically the missionary, um, that's the missionary task. <laughs> so we live in a disruptive age, and the State of the Church report talks about a lot of elements of disruption. What else have you seen disrupted over the last few decades in New York City and in culture? Um, well, one of, the, one of the things, of course, is that the, um, the most disruptive thing is that there were always a kind of, um, how do I say it, there was always a small number of evangelical and maybe conservative Catholics who were very devout. And they had, you know, Christian, uh, they were very devoutly Christian, but they also had Christian ethics, so they, mm you know, the uh, Christian view of morality and sexuality and things like that. Um, that's maybe 20%. 
Then there was 80% of the, of the population who were nominal Christians. They didn't, I mean, they went to church on Christmas and Easter. You know, they said they were Methodist or Presbyterian or Catholic, but they, it, wasn't, they, it wasn't very deep. And yet, they actually held the Christian views too. Hmm. And that was, I, the reason I'm making these strange gestures is they were like an umbrella. Okay. They were a shelter because to be a, a, an Orthodox Evangelical or Catholic and to have all these views of things didn't look that weird because 70, 80 percent of the population had the same view of marriage right. and sexuality and things like that. But when that has gone away, what's going away is inherited religion is dying, not chosen religion, hmm. not religion based on conversion, but re inherited religion where you're born into it. My family's Methodist. I went to church growing up. That's just going away. You know, young people say, uh, unless I choose it, it's not Nobody can choose my right. religion for me. So the idea that you're, you're, you're born into a Catholic family or a Presbyterian family is going away, and that's the reason why the main line and the Catholic Church is just collapsing. And so what you have is these devout people are pretty much the same number of really devout Christians, but now they look really weird. <laughs> and they, in fact, they look dangerous and strange because, you see what I mean, that protective yeah. covering is gone. And that means... Um, more ostracism, more uh, strangeness, uh, more estrangeness from the culture. That's the big thing that's happening, I think, right now. When you look into the future, is there anything that you can see on the radar that you're like, hey, leaders, pay attention to this? Well, the political polarization, yes, okay, I'll, here's where I, go, where I would go. Um, the political polarization that's happening now is uh, a major challenge for churches because uh, here's my reading of the Bible. My reading of the Bible says that Christians ought to be sold out for racial justice. Mm. To all, the, all races are equal, all in the image of God. They should be deeply concerned about the poor and the marginalized. They should be pro-life and they should believe, at least for Christians, that the sex should only be between an, a man and a woman in marriage. Okay? Now, those four things, that the early church was marked by them, we know that. Hmm. Okay. Um, two of those look very conservative, two of those look very liberal. And so right now what's happening is, since those four things are never combined in any political party, they're hmm. not combined in any, any other institution other than Catholic social teaching and, you know, biblical Christianity. And so what happens is there's enormous pressure, enormous pressure everywhere in the country for churches to major in two of them and get quiet about two of them. Mm -hmm. So in New York, huge pressure for the churches in New York City to talk about racial justice and caring about the poor. Everybody applauds, but if you say we're pro-life or we think sex should be only between a man and a woman in marriage, is there people are gonna pick at you. Yeah. I would say in the middle of Alabama, if an evangelical pastor starts to preach about all four of those things, a lot of the people are going to get nervous about the racial justice and poverty thing and say, that sounds kind of liberal, that sounds kind of like, you know, wait a minute, what are you doing here? And so I don't know anywhere where uh, it seems to me that there's a kind of red evangelicalism and a blue evangelicalism. And almost everywhere I see people like play up two of those and play down two of those. Or even actually stop believing in two of those. Right. And that's because there's this enormous, pre these are package deals. The, the political parties say, you can't have them together. You have to, you know, in other words, to be a Democrat or be a Republican, for example, be Fox News or MSNBC, you just can't keep those things together. And yet, and so that is, the, to me, the biggest challenge for Christian leaders. How do you be, um, how do you be committed to the, the whole range? That's the early church. It's biblical. So, <clears throat> so all four of those, Tim, have been, I think, hallmarks of Redeemer, at least to the extent that I've been able to access hundreds of your sermons over the years and your writing and your preaching. How have you held that tension in New York? Well, it hasn't been easy. I mean, <laughs> I mean there are occasions. I have definitely seen people get up in the middle of sermons and walk out, yeah. which is always a little bit... Um, satisfying. <laughs> because when you see that, you do say, 
all right, okay, I'm not a total coward here. <laughs> <laughs> because, see, here's the thing. I do think you have to care about context. Yeah. Which means, for example, is you don't want to pat yourself on the bat and say, I'm valiant tr for truth because I'm preaching against abortion every month. Right. Uh, there are certainly people who criticize me for not preaching about abortion constantly. And I do say, all right, look, if, if I have a non-Christian coming to church, I don't want them to get hit over the head with something that I know that they're going to be offended by within the first two weeks they come. So am I going to be careful about my context? Am I going to realize what offends people and what attracts people? Yeah. So I mean, I would say that if I was in Alabama, I'm in the middle of New York City, I wouldn't preach identically. Hmm. I wouldn't be reaching non-Christians the same way. Nevertheless, what you have to do to your leaders constantly, is, at least your leaders, you have to say, we cannot get cold feet on any of this. Hmm. I mean, th there is no biblical warrant. I mean, <clears throat> here in Amer you know, here I'd have to say, you all get excited about what the Bible says about justice, and, and, to, and you don't get excited about what the Bible says about sexuality. <clears throat> and at that point, you're really not letting the Bible animate you, you're letting the culture animate you. And, um, you know, you've just got to immerse yourself in the Word, because they go together, by the way. You know, there's, a, there's one, I think it's Amos chapter 2, verse 7, where it says, a father and a son go into the same woman, and they sell the poor for a pair of shoes. Mm. So one verse, sexual sin and economic injustice, the Bible sees it as a whole cloth. They go mm. together. And we live in a culture that just tries to rip that apart. So important, for, important safety tip for leaders. <laughs> Tim, at this phase in your life, you've committed the last few years mm. in the future to Redeemer City to City. You came to New York in uh -huh. 1989 why cities, and talk about why cities are so important and so strategic. Well, one of the reasons cities are so important for um, the world mission of the church is that they're growing. Hmm. And when Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples, he didn't mean go into all the world geographically. He didn't say, go to Antarctica and start churches, <laughs> okay? Even though it's a big part of, you know, geography. Yeah. He meant go to the world demographically. He meant go to where the people are. And uh, the people of the world are moving into cities faster than the church is. Mm. So if we, if we don't spend a lot of, of effort to plant churches in the cities that are growing and growing and growing, then we are actually not obeying the Great Commission. So there's the one answer. A second answer is cities are uniquely difficult places, especially the biggest cities, to plant churches. They're horribly expensive. Um, they are uh, extraordinarily culturally diverse. So you look out there and the people are from every tongue tribe, people and nation, and you want to know, who am I preaching to? And, and so it's, it's, it's complicated culturally, it's extremely expensive, and for those reasons, we felt at Redeemer City to City that we didn't know of any mission agency that specialized just in urban, in just big, mm. big uh, church planning in global, great big global cities. And since Redeemer had th 30 years of experience, we said, well, there's, let's just leverage that. Uh, we're not saying that everybody's got to go to a city. We're not saying that we only should plant churches in cities. But we're saying is that it's a, a, a huge need demographically. And it's, it's, you can't just pick up and do what you did out in the field, mm. you know, in the suburbs or in the small towns in the city. You have to, you have to, it's got peculiar issues. And so why not just leverage our expertise and say, that's what we do. So uh, years ago, City to City was started to say, not that we sne sneer at anybody else, but we just know that city churches need a lot of help. And so we're going to do that. And so three years ago now, almost three years ago, when I left Redeemer, I stepped full time into City to City. And that's all we do is we uh, help national leaders. We don't send Americans. Hmm. We help national leaders everywhere in the world reach their biggest global cities. And they have problems. Uh, uh, the, the house churches that proliferate all through China have trouble when they go into the big cities because the ministry needs are different. Um, so just because a church is growing in a country doesn't mean it's reaching its biggest city, and that's, that's what we try to do. Mm. And I, I love the point you made in one of your sermons that uh, was on the book of Jonah, that Jonah was trying to run away from a city, right. and God actually said, no, that's exactly where you should go. When things get bad, God goes into a city, when things get bad, Christians usually leave the city. 
Yeah, and uh, because because they're thinking more of their own comfort than they are of usefulness. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes people say, well, you've been in New York now. I've lived in New York twice as long as I've lived anywhere else in my life. Mm -hmm. And it won't be long before I, I will have lived in New York if I live long enough. If I live a few more years, I'll have lived longer in New York than I've lived everywhere else in the world. <laughs> wow. So people say, well, does it feel like home? Well, even my own children who grew up here, um, my youngest especially, who I don't, who, who doesn't really remember anything but New York. New York is so unmanageable. I remember the very first day I came here and I talked to a few people administered in New York. There was a woman who had lived here for years and said, I want you to know that New York City is unmanageable. And what she meant by that is nobody, anybody says this is my town. That's just hubris. Uh, it's the big cities of the world are are they're, they are too complicated, they are difficult, they are extremely inconvenient. Almost anywhere is more, inc more convenient than living in a great big city. Um, but she says, you want to be here not because you can manage it because it's more comfortable, but because you're so useful here. Hmm. Because there's so many people, there's so much need. Um, so, I, you know, what we try to do is we try to give people, Christians who come to these cities, to have a ministry mindset. Don't come just as a teeth gritter who's going to use the city to pad your resume and then go back to wherever you're going to be. Don't use it as a consumer. You say, oh, I just love cities, which means I love the restaurants and I love all the ethos and all that. I say, come here as a minister. Come and love the city. That, that doesn't mean you may, li you may not even like the city. Hmm. But loving the city means caring about the people of the city, caring about the infrastructure, caring about the schools caring about the neighborhoods, you know, come and love the city. And if you were going to be here for two years, make it four. If you're <laughs> going to be here for five years, make it ten. Uh, or even consider just living here. So that's the attitude, not like, oh, you got to be here, you know. No, you just, you just try to give people a ministry mindset. Uh, and I think it will bear a lot of fruit because mm -hmm. cities, uh, as cities go, so goes the cultures. So I know you're committed to human flourishing and the State of the Church Report has an awful lot to say about it. I heard that. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I want to share five categories with you of human flourishing. Yeah. This is some of Barna's research that David Kinnaman has done. It's Harvard and Biblical Concepts of Spiritual Formation. And as I share them, I'd just like you to kind of riff on it. Just mm -hmm. talk about what that means to you, why it's important to the church mm -hmm. in your view. But we'll start with relationship. And the definition in the report is how biblical community and relational, relational health impact human flourishing. So right. just relationship. Give, give me all five. Okay, so relationships, spiritual health, fiscal and material stability, vocation and career, and wellness and behavioral health. Those are the five components that contribute to um, uh, yeah. human flourishing. I know this could be no. a book. Well, yeah, obviously. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that is, um, that's a great list because it really does, it is comprehensive. It is true that as a church, if you're caring about people's flourishing, you really cannot ignore any of those. Yeah. Uh, there's no doubt that I think probably um, most churches would say the first two, we're going to talk about that. The last three, not so much. Of course, the one mm -hmm. about giving, yes, as long as it's giving to the yeah. church. <laughs> yeah, fiscal stability, my fiscal stability right. as a church leader. <clears throat> It tends to lose, it, it, most churches, most evangelical churches, um, d they're not very good at talking to them about money in general. They, they, right. they, they talk about give us some money. They certainly, the, the fourth one is not mentioned much at all, I Vocation think. Vocation and career. No, because it's, um, I think part of that is because we pastors are not trained on how to help people there. Um, you see, if somebody comes and says, I want you to help me study the Bible and pray, Got it. I've been trained to help you. Let me give you these books. I'll meet with you. But somebody comes in and says, you know, I'm an actor, and um, I don't know which parts I should take as a Christian and which parts I shouldn't, and I got some questions about um, certain roles and, uh, you know, what, what does it mean to be a Christian actor? And I, I'm not, you know, as a pastor, I don't yeah. know what to do. And I would say, you have to figure that out yourself. I don't know. See, what happens, I think, when it comes to that one, is there's an equality between the pastor, the minister, and the layperson that we don't have in the other areas. Hmm. Um, the, um, 
we don't, I may not know much about acting, he doesn't maybe know as much about the Bible. And we have to sit down and kind of work together. So it's not a matter of him coming and me telling him. Yeah, you're not the expert. Right. And the last one, I actually do feel that we have a tendency to uh, outsource that. <laughs> Wellness and, and behavioral health. Yeah, and yeah. not talk about it and say, go to a psychiatrist or go to a doctor or a medical doctor. I do think that there needs to be better ways for maybe Christians who are medical professionals to, yeah. inside the church, talk to people about it. Um, all that stuff, though, is fruit of the Spirit, all five mm. of them. See, <clears throat> here, this is my take on the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, integrity, humility, faithfulness, self-control. So um, love, patience, and kindness is largely about relationships. Joy, peace, and humility is largely about spiritual disciplines. And um, self-control, faithfulness, which is uh, faithfulness, integrity, those things actually have a lot more to do with, with the last three. Hmm. So, I mean, basically, the fruit of the Spirit covers it. Um, it does. Uh, the fruit of the Spirit are uh, God, sp Spirit-created character. And so I do think you can... Um, if you went to the fruit of the spirit and you went to the book of Proverbs, they're all covered because Proverbs mm. talks about all yeah, those yeah. five areas. In a way, the, uh, sometimes there's other places in the New Testament that don't. But if you go to Proverbs, and I, my wife and I did a devotional yeah, going spent through the book of Proverbs. Twenty eighteen in it. Yeah, did Thank you? you? Well, pr there's nothing that Proverbs doesn't talk about. Yeah, it talks about every single area of human flourishing. So, mm. I would say if you went to Proverbs and you went to the fruit of the spirit, you basically could preach that and and that would be a I do think that's a great way of mm -hmm. telling people you really can't ignore any of these areas and you've got to make sure that you're honoring Christ in each of the areas. Hmm. Um, it's interesting because you raised it. Hamilton's playing right down the street. I mean we're right in the heart of New York City and you picked an actor as an example. How would you approach that? Actor knocks on your door, a redeemer, and says, hey Tim, what part should I take? What part should I not take? I would try, I would probably create a little, John, I got this idea from John Stott years ago. <clears throat> it would be good to get a couple of the Christian actors, maybe a little more, a um, little more experienced, yeah. both in Christianity and in acting. <laughs> it would probably be good to maybe even get an academic. I mean, there are people who, te I, I, we do have, by the way, people who, who um, used to go to Redeemer have moved to other um, uh, have moved to other colleges and taught acting. Oh. I mean, I know one woman who teaches acting at a, at a secular school in New England, um, another guy who teaches acting at a Christian college. And so these are people who've not only done it, but they've actually had to do reflection on it. So he would say, get an academic, get a practitioner, get a theologian, get a pastor, and, and come together and generate questions and then have a meeting over a period of year, maybe meet every month or every two months and, um, and work on the questions together. And that way, and it's kind of egalitarian because no one person has got all the answers. And have somebody take notes. Um, and it's, it can be... That's I've, a great idea. Yeah, I know, I've done that in other areas. I wish I had more time to do it, yeah. That's no, that's a really good idea. And I know <coughs> vocation's really important to David as well, David Kinnaman, we mm -hmm. talk about it a lot. <coughs> um, so also in the report, um, Barna asked pastors, what are the top concerns for uh, the church? And these are some of the top findings. Water down gospel teachings, the culture shift to secularism, poor discipleship, declining attendance, and reaching a younger audience. Kind of touched on a lot of those already in different ways. Um, and we've kind of topped on you, uh, touched on your top concerns for the church. Anything you want to add to that before we move on? Well, that's an interesting list. Um, watered yeah. down gospel. I do think that what they're getting at there is we may be over adapting to the, um, the identity narrative. The identity narrative is you've got to be true to yourself and you've got mm -hmm. to feel good about yourself. <clears throat> and it's, it's possible that you start to adapt the gospel and turn it into something where Jesus just makes you feel good about yourself. Mm. And by the way, what I did there a minute ago or a few minutes yeah. ago about how you would talk about the Christian identity, unless you're careful, it can really sound like Chris, uh, Jesus is here to boost your self-esteem. Right. You, 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 <clears throat> you, you, you have to say that 
when Christ's love becomes your identity, it reorders all your loves, mm. which means and this is that's August, that's Augustine. What he would say is when when Christ is your supreme love, he's both the support, he's the source of your love, but he's also your supreme love. What that does is it it, it demotes everything else without a it demotes other identities without effacing them, hmm. which is another way of saying, if you're Chinese um, and you become a Christian, you don't stop being you don't start being anything else. You're still Chinese, but the, your your greatest pride is in what Christ, what, who you are in Christ, and therefore what it does is it takes racial pride, it takes vocational pride, it takes those things down a notch, and that has to be said. Otherwise, if you're if you're not careful, you say you find your identity. I've I've seen youth group where <laughs> people are told you find your identity in Christ which means God loves you even if you're you screw up he just loves you all the time and and you should feel good about yourself and not hate yourself and it actually just becomes not a an understanding of how your whole life is reordered by the gospel it's more mm -hmm. like it's like Jesus basically makes you feel better about yourself as regardless you regardless of whether you change regardless that's right yeah and that's watered down gospel which is more of a self esteemism hmm. um, and um, I think that's I think that's right, and I think that's probably what they're getting at. That's yeah. a concern of mine, too. Sure. Uh, you've done, uh, it's also, uh, Barna has a partnership with Glue. Big Data is really making, uh, um, yeah, yeah, we live in a very different age. You've done some um, work with Barna over the years where you've done studies for your work at Redeemer in yeah, City to City. What is, in your mind, the line between being data-informed and data driven. Well, the the German philosopher, not a Christian, by the way, Jürgen Habermas, uh -huh. has is famous for saying. Well, he's famous for more than this, but he he said that while science can tell you what you can do and how to do it efficiently, it can never ever tell you whether you should do it or not. Hmm. In other words, you can't, get a, you can't get an ought out of an is. You can't get an ought out of an is. So science can tell you what is. It can never tell you what it ought to be. And you have to be careful. When I have people saying, well, the data shows that you should do this, the data can't show you what you ought to do. Uh -huh. The data can inform you about what is. And on the basis of what is, I can make decisions. But I make decisions on the basis of my moral values, which I get from the scripture. Hmm. So uh, there, there is a little danger that you say, well, the, you know, it, uh, for example, my church does not have to grow. What do you mean it, by that? It doesn't say anywhere in the Bible your church has to grow. I mean, you're, ordinarily, if people are growing spiritually and they're sharing their faith, the church will grow. Right. But the, uh, that's, a, that's a byproduct. I mean, the church must grow spiritually. The church must grow in joy. It must grow in worship. Uh, uh, it must grow in those things, and if it's going to grow numerically, then it ought to be a byproduct of that. And therefore, I don't want to just do something that kind of does an end run around those things and just gets more people in the door. Right. And sometimes data can look like it's saying, well, if, this, if you do this, you will grow. That's, so anyway, I would say the data can tell me what is, but it can't tell me what I ought to do. <laughs> and if it looks like it is, then I think it's overstepped its bounds. Anything else on the state of the church today? Before we switch gears, I want to talk about preaching. But anything else on what you see, what worries you, what excites you? Um, what confuses me. Okay. Okay, you didn't ask that, but... Well, what, let's do what, that. What confuses me is I'm not sure how hostile the culture will get. Hmm. So should we assume that all the evangelical uh, colleges will lose their accreditation? For example, yeah. uh, should we assume that um, you know Christian radio stations will lose their FCC licenses because of they would be considered bigoted or you know hateful and that kind of thing? I think that's at least possible. In other words, if you, we should not live in fearfulness of that, especially as I've traveled around the world as a speaker in the last few years, and everybody's got it worse than we do. <laughs> I mean, the, yeah. everybody's yeah. got it worse than we do. Yeah. Um, and certainly Americans, I mean, you, you, you're in Canada. I mean, yeah. certainly Americans have it even better than, than well, Christians. Well, it's a little bit tighter where I am, yeah. yeah, for sure. Nevertheless, I would say that we have to be not afraid of that, but we also should be ready for it. Mm. So we should be not afraid, but ready, and not be shocked if it happens. 
Do you mourn that? No, not necessarily. I mean, here's the thing. It would be, I, I see, it, to me, it's win-win, believe it or not. The win is, if it doesn't happen, hey, that's great. I mean, mm. there's great advantages to being able to keep your accreditation, your FCC license, and to keep on moving and have your endowment funds. And it's, it's, it's better for institution building. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if it goes away, it's probably better for us spiritually. It probably is. Even like the whole tax question? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I, if it goes away, it's better for us spiritually. If it stays, it's better for us institutionally. Would you fight it? Um... Oh, I would fight, fight. What do you mean? I mean, what well, I, what like, would I, you, would you, would you petition governments and that kind yeah, of thing? Yeah, sure. I'm not sure they'd listen. <laughs> yeah, I'd be very happy to sign a petition for it. Sure. Okay. In other words, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Uh, yeah. I mean, lightly. I would, lightly, I, but you wouldn't. You wouldn't. No, go to the mat or say this is mm -hmm. the end of the world or how can you do this? I mean, most of the other parts of the world, you know, uh, you don't have the, uh, the the ministers, you know, yeah. tax break. You don't have the. Uh, the nonprofit status, a lot of no, churches. No, no. We still have it. that in Canada, but every time you know I get mail on that, I'm like, well, this feels like the first century more and more all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would, I would not not make it easy, but on the other hand, like I said, it's a win-win. I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's talk about preaching. Um, what have you learned? And we, again, we've touched on this, but I think you're masterful at communicating to a post-Christian culture, and New York has been more post-Christian than a lot of America, and America is becoming very checkerboard. I mean, you yeah. go up the coasts, yeah. it's much more, you go into the cities, it's much more post-Christian. Yeah. I spend a lot of time in the Bible Belt, and there it's generational. You look at Gen Z and millennials, they're very right. post-Christian. Yeah, and, and, it, and it, what's sad about those areas is a lot of times the uh, older people don't realize it's happening. 100%. Yeah. yeah, and so you can go into the very center, for example, if you go to the center of some of these conservative cities, right. if you go to the center of Houston, or you go to the center mm -hmm. of you know, these Bible Belt cities, there's, um, th the younger generation is, is definitely walking away from yeah. faith. They could be in California or New York. That's right, yeah. that's right. And very often the parents aren't as completely aware of it as right. they would be. So yeah. Okay. What would you say to those kids? Well, I think it's, um, I would say that the, the, the Christianity has better resources for what they're trying to do um, you're looking for freedom, you're looking for meaning, you're looking for satisfaction, you're looking for identity, you're looking for a basis for doing justice. Mm -hmm. you, want a, you want a basis for doing justice that doesn't turn you into an oppressor yourself? Do you want to have an identity that's not performative, that is not exclusive? Do you, I said, I got better resources for you. Mm -hmm. I mean, now, here's why. I would start there with them, rather than start with what I'd call hard apologetics. Mm -hmm. now, here's the evidence for the resurrection. Uh, there's a, there's a, a ponce by Blaise Pascal who said, uh, he says, bring people to the place where they wish Christianity was true, then show them that it's true. Hmm. So there's really no reason for me to get out the guns on the evidence for the resurrection, stuff like that, which is trying to show them that Christianity is true, if they don't want it to be true. Yeah. But if I get them to want it, if, if they get to the place where they say, gee, it would be great if that was true, but is it? Then, then I can do my, your more traditional So apologize. speaking to the identity pieces. Would, right, yeah. identity, freedom, meaning, satisfaction, right. justice. You, 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 you speak to the, the, um, the values they have and that they're trying, uh, you have to have an operational way to get those things. You can't live without those things. Well, I think you made the argument, others have made the argument, that in some ways the culture still has the values of Christianity without the faith of Christianity to some especially, extent. Especially, yeah, especially yeah. in the area of morality and justice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, we have a questionnaire that I, uh, in my evangelism class, I ask people to go talk to a non-Christian friend and they have a set of questions uh, to ask them. And um, one of the questions is, how do you determine whether something is right or wrong? How do you make a moral judgment? And question. all of them, he said, almost all the secular people actually tie, the, tie themselves into pretzels. <laughs> because I said, look, my, the, the, the assignment is not to actually get into a debate. But you can, if you want, ask a, a follow-up question. And the follow-up question there is to say, how do you tell somebody who doesn't feel that what they're doing is wrong and whose culture tells them it's not wrong that they're doing something wrong? How, how, what, what would you say to them? 
um, and they just have no idea because they, they, on the one hand, they're relativists and they say nobody can tell me what is right or wrong mm -hmm. for me. But then, on the other hand, they want to do, they want to tell other people not to live unjust lives, and that is deeply incoherent. So that would be one of the things I would be talking to them about. The fact is that they don't have a basis for, they don't have a sufficient moral source for their moral ideals. Hmm. But that would be still not, not the hard apologetics. That's still saying Christianity has better resources for the things you're seeking than you have. And if I got them to the place where they said, oh, that's interesting, um, that'd be, you know, but how do I know this is true? Then I could say, well, let's read the Gospels. Let's talk about the claims of Jesus. Then you get into more traditional apologetics. Well, it's interesting. I mean, you've written a lot about apologetics and spoken a lot about apologetics, but I was listening to a talk you gave years ago, and I'm sure you've written about this as well, um, and I'm paraphrasing here, but you said, the place to start with apologetics is not with hard logic. Like, there are so many codices in the New Testament, et cetera, et cetera. Right, yeah. Because people don't actually respond to logic. They respond right. to emotion. Yeah. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Well, what they're is that accurate? Yeah, and I, okay. I yes, and I was trying to s say this. They they've got to want it to be true before they're open to an argument that it is. And they can only want it to be true is if you actually, in a sense, do emotional apologetics. Hmm. There, there's actually a book. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, I can't recommend every part of it. Okay. But a book by Francis Spufford called Unapologetic. He's a, he's a very cheeky British writer <laughs> who is a professing Christian, not a full, and certainly not an evangelical one, not okay. an orthodox one. But <clears throat> the subtitle of the book is Why, in spite of everything, Christianity still makes great emotional sense. That's, that's the subtitle. Hmm. And I thought that's pretty brilliant. That's what I was trying to talk about. Yeah, yeah. Is that if, for people to think Christianity makes emotional sense, that it gives you a workable approach to identity, or it gives you a, it, it promises a happiness or a love that you find desirable, or it gives you a basis for making moral judgments that, that doesn't turn you into a Pharisee, but at the same time gives you a basis. It says when people start to emotionally want that, because those aren't, that's not hard logic. Hmm. It's more like saying, look, I, I have better resources than you do for the things you're dealing with. So it's part of that pointing out the problem, yes. anticipating the objections. Yes, I'm trying that. to show them that Christianity makes emotional sense. And if it makes emotional sense, they'll be open to a argument that it makes rational sense. Can you That's walk what us I was through trying to say. an example, just to make it crystal clear? Well, um, y you, know, you might say, um, um, C.S. Lewis, I'll give you an example. C.S. Lewis, when he does his um, argument from desire in his famous chapter in Mere Christianity on Hope, yeah. and what he says is, that he starts off by saying, if you're young, you may not have experienced this, but as you get out in life, you're going to realize that all the things you thought were really going to make you happy don't do it. And he does a wonderful job of saying, the job you thought would be make you happy, the marriage you thought would make you happy, the, um, um, the, the, the travel you thought would make you happy. At first it seems like this is finally going to do it and it, it goes away in the grasping of it. And then he says, I'm not talking about bad marriages. Hmm. I'm not talking about bad jobs. I'm not talking about bad, uh, bad trips. He says, I'm talking about the best possible ones. And you're going to find out that nothing actually satisfies. There's still a kind of emptiness. Um, and then he says, now, once you decide that, there's only two or three possibilities. One is you could say, I just, I need a better wife, I need a better trip, I need a better job, and out there, that happiness is out there in this world. Mm -hmm. The second thing you can do, he says, that'll just make you a, an absolutely, uh, it's going to make you driven, it's going to make you anxious. The second thing you can do is say, um, there is no happiness, there is no satisfaction, I just have to harden myself, stop crying after the moon, just gets cynical and he says, well, that might make you less of a nuisance to people, but it also is going to dehumanize you. It's going to kill the part of your heart that really wants love and wants happiness and satisfaction. He says, and the third possibility is this. He says, ducklings want to swim, there's such a thing as water. Babies want to suck milk, there's such a thing as milk. 
Desires don't exist unless satisfaction for those desires exists. And if you find in yourself a desire for something that nothing in this world can satisfy, it probably means you were made for another world. Mm. Now, that's logical, and yet it's basically working on emotion. It's yeah. really not. Yeah. It's not the evidence for the resurrection. It's not saying there's the existence of God. It was trying to say there is a, an emptiness in you that you can either say, I'm going to find it, in this world, or you can say, I'm going to kill my desire for happiness and then become a real cynic and, and snob. Or you can say, there's actually something else out there. There's another way. Now, if I was preaching this, and I, I do actually preach yeah. this, I would add the Buddhist approach, <clears throat> and the, which, the Eastern approach, which is, which is to say that the world is an illusion. Hmm. It's a little bit like hardening your heart, but it's, 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 it seems more spiritual. But ultimately, it does make you detach, and I could, make a, I could make a case against it. So what I would do is I'm actually doing argument, I'm doing apologetics, mm -hmm. but it's, uh, it's trying to make Christianity make emotional sense. Hmm. And only if it makes emotional sense would people want eventually to sit and listen to an argument why it makes intellectual sense. I don't know whether you would think this has changed a lot, but a lot of people would see a, a surge in the new atheism. Everybody from Sam Harris to Christopher Hitchens to uh, Yuval Harari and people like that who yeah. have written a lot of books. And some of their arguments are fairly strong. Right. You could make the argument that uh, perhaps we're not doing very well on that front as Christians these days with a few, you know, present company accepted. Um, well... Go ahead. So say what you're going to say. I'm sorry. <laughs> I cut you off. No, no, no. There, so you're asking me what I think that. of that? Well, I'm saying, what do you think their best arguments are? Oh. That was going to be my question. What well, do you think the best arguments of the new atheists are? I actually think that the, the older new atheists, like uh, Sam Harris and, and uh, of course, uh, uh, Hitchens is dead. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, the original Dawkins. I think, actually, their stridency has actually uh, faded. Mm. I mean, I, th I think they're, they're, the bl uh, I don't know, they're still it's, striving. It's, it's, it's faded because... It's got a little they're, muddier, they're, you mean? No, no, they're old. And even a Harari, mm -hmm. he's, a, he's a more recent one. Yeah. But that's not where kids are. Okay. They, they are, the new atheists are saying science will solve everything. Mm. Um, it's sort of an old uh, enlightenment approach that sort of sees everything rationally. Um, and... Uh, Younger people today are all about justice. Hmm. They're all about identity, and they. I don't. Th I actually don't think that that kind of very detached intellectual, scientific enlightenment thing that you know science has got the answers to everything. I don't. I don't think younger people resonate with that. So back to what we talked about earlier. Yeah, I actually. Oh, I wow. think. I don't think that they're in ascendancy anymore. I think hmm. that they're fading. They also do come across as just as fundamentalist and and narrow-minded as. <laughs> fundamentalist. Oh, yeah, yeah. Harari especially at yeah, the they, end of some of his works. I know. And, but, and yet the books are still selling. Very well. They're still making, <laughs> Very making well. a lot of money. Yeah. When I say they're not they in the ascendancy, it doesn't mean they're not making a good income. Yeah. So. Um, so we got a lot of preachers listening who are like, I think I'm stuck in Christendom. Do you want to give them some tips on how to move out of that mindset? And I mean, whether that's generational uh, in the Bible Belt or they're in a city and they're not having the impact that they wish they would. What are some starting points for some preachers to oh connect boy. better? So, okay, well, yeah. you want the cigar as the hardest question. <laughs> you get the cigar for the hardest question. Thank you. Because there's not a lot of great examples. Uh, what worries me is, mm. um, I, I, I already told you, I think that the, 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 mega, the seeker megachurch, I still think is probably, it's, it's not the place a lot of the younger, justice-oriented, postmodern people are showing up. I yeah. still think it, it um, it's really not, the, it's not the way of the future, I don't think. Okay. Um, I, I would say if you can find a multi-ethnic church in a city that's growing and it's not compromising on any of those four things, on the, the sex, the pro-life, the, uh, the justice, the racial, if it's multi-ethnic, if it's really equally sh evangelizing people, calling to repentance, and doing justice, uh, calling people to be to uh, be a sexual counterculture, and uh, work on being anti-racist. If you find a church like that that's growing, um, and and orthodox and true to the whole, you know, panel of those things, 
they're probably doing what I'm, or they're probably doing what they ought to do. Probably, mm. Mm. probably, uh, go there. But I don't. If you mean a movement, a book, I mean even. No, my, I, even I, I, I just mean like they're stuck in an old mindset. How do they begin to detach well, from you that and move forward? You could re, you could you could read Leslie Newbigin now. Newbigin died in 1999. Yeah. Um, and and so he's already somewhat dated. I mean, he's already looking at a post-Christian West that has already moved from when he saw it. Yeah. And yet, he was just ahead of his time. And so I would I would if you could read Foolishness of the Greeks, and uh, the Gospel in the Pluralist Society. I mean, Gospel in the Pluralist Society. I think yeah. that's right. Those two books would be great starting points. Okay. They'd be really good starting points. That's good. Anything else on the megachurch movement that you've seen over the last 40 years mm. develop? I, um, Knowing a lot of them are listening. Well, I, I mean, obviously, <laughs> I, I planted a megachurch yeah, I mean, by anybody's standards. Yeah. And at this point, I feel like um, I think it was the right thing to do to let it get that big. Mm. There wouldn't be a Redeemer City to City. There wouldn't yeah. be a counseling center. There wouldn't be Hope for New York. There wouldn't be all sorts of stuff. And I do think that for New York to grow an evangelical megachurch was a good thing for the whole ecosystem, I think. Yeah. Um, it is breaking up. I broke up Ma Bell. I mean, we were already three and eventually four, five, six churches. Yeah. So not, there is no 6,000 person Redeemer church anymore. There's right. a whole slew of them. And I think that's good because mm. generally speaking, when a church gets over 1,000 people, there's a, it, it really becomes much more bureaucratic. I'll give you two, two real quick. I mean, I, it sounds kind of negative mm. about big churches. The, um, uh, the pastors can't know everybody. Yeah. Like I always say to a pastor, if you can interview every single new member personally, then your church is still small enough. And if you can't do that anymore, it's too big. Mm. Secondly, what happens is, <clears throat> If you, listen, if you run a pharmacy, uh, you start a pharmacy, you're probably a pharmacist. You probably know how to stock the shelves. And then maybe you, you grow your pharmacy and then you form a second pharmacy and a third pharmacy even. Generally, the people running those pharmacies are still pharmacists. They actually know what it means to make it a good experience for people to come in the door and buy things. But when you have 50 pharmacies in a chain, <clears throat> The people running it know almost nothing about pharmaceuticals. They're just looking on ROI, return on investment, bottom lines. They're just operating like, um, um, they're basically financial people. Yeah. And what ends up happening in a very large church is more and more that both the staff and the, the lay leaders become people who are not so much doing the ministry at the bottom. They're not, they're not the pharmacists anymore. They're people who are looking at systems and doing all these things. and I don't think that's healthy. Mm. So I actually have been saying, um, frankly, the, the city would be better off with 10 churches of 500 people in general than one church of 5,000. Having said that, I think almost every city needs a couple of mega churches because they can do things nobody else can do. Mm -hmm. A couple. Yeah. But I wouldn't aspire to be the pastor of a mega church. I just want you to know that. <laughs> there you go. For, for the reasons I just mentioned, yeah, there's uh, it's a it's a discipleship problem, mm. a lot of passivity, um, and there's a bureaucracy po problem where people spend an awful lot of time in just looking at systems instead of doing ministry. So, um, I would say, looking forward, I think churches uh, basically. I'm not a big house church fan, in mm. spite of the fact that Francis Chan and other people think it's the it's the solution. Yeah. I would say moderate sized churches, <laughs> you know, one hundred to eight hundred is the way forward. Well, you're speaking to most of the people listening to or watching this. So yeah. I've got a list of questions that uh, and you've been so generous with your time, but I'd love to close with this one. Sure. A lot of leaders listening in right now are discouraged, personally. It's been a tough season, it's hard at home. I'm yeah. sure you've had seasons of discouragement. Mm -hmm. Do you want to just tell us about a time where you felt discouraged and how you got yourself through it? <laughs> just so many. <laughs> 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 how will I ever choose uh, them? Uh, uh, you know, I, the hard, <clears throat> if you're talking about leadership, the hardest time was um, there was a, a period from about 2001 to 2000 
five or so that was tough for me as a leader because 9-11 mm -hmm. happened and that's a whole big story. 9-11 yeah. in New York City is a, it's a world of, of discussion as I, I can't yeah. go there. But the whole city got depressed and everybody mm -hmm. burned out. It was, it, it was um, the, the day after 9-11, day after, uh, a Christian minister from Oklahoma City who had been through the Oklahoma City bombing called and told me um, you're going to have a lot of trouble in your church for the next three or four years. You're going to have people burning out. You're going to have people uh, grieving. You're going to have you're going to have all sorts of trouble. And he, he kind of gave me the list. Uh, on top of that, I got thyroid cancer. On mm -hmm. top of that, my wife had Crohn's disease, had a big flare up, and had all, multiple surgeries on her body. And um, I stayed the pastor, but basically really let the staff kind of go. Mm. And when I actually came back to health after about two years, basically, I was still preaching and all that. I came back to health uh, and I sat down with my staff and I found out they were all bitter <laughs> because they'd, I'd left them on their own. And they also formed these little silos and they were actually all having turf battles and it was a wreck. It was a total wreck. And so I said, oh my gosh, are we ever going to get out of this? And basically, I, frankly, I, uh, I did hire a new executive director, Bruce Terrell, who was probably the single biggest um, help at cleaning all that up and, um, you know, reintegrating the staff mm. into a community. But for the about two or three years before that, I'm not sure how we made it other than to say, you've got to keep going, you've got to pray. And my wife was so sick that at a certain point there I thought maybe I should leave the ministry. Mm. But I couldn't tell her about it because then she would feel guilty. But I couldn't tell anybody else about it because I felt I would betray her. Mm. So I didn't tell anybody. And I li lived with that for a couple of years and um, never really uh, uh, never really resolved it other than God never gave me the freedom to leave. Hmm. So prayer, that is when my prayer life really kicked in, in hmm. a new way. I mean, my prayer life changed drastically right during that period of time. Just deepened, got stronger, and pretty much worth it. The whole <laughs> thing was worth it just for that. So, but no, no, no key, you know, God sent in somebody was important. He deepened my prayer life. That's how, that's how you get through it. Tim, this has been rich, deep, and such a privilege. Thank you. Thanks for, thanks for the thanks. <laughs>well i hope today's episode was helpful to you you can always get more by subscribing to my channel i also have a lot more content over at kerryneuhoff.com for leaders in business and leaders in churches and uh, you can get transcripts of this episode there and so much more plus some other stuff i do for leaders so head on over there to discover more at kerryneuhoff.com and in the meantime i really hope our time together today has helped you lead like never before